well, it's wonderful to see all of you. I um, want to say that uh, I had the opportunity yesterday to come and walk through a number of the sessions. Couldn't stay long enough in any given session, and I couldn't have been more impressed with the conversations and learned a great deal. So I really want to thank all of you for your incredible interest and dedication and for um, being back today for a second day of, I'm sure, which will be excellent conversations, and I'll continue learning together um, at this very, very important time. So again, I want to express my appreciation and thank all of you for what I thought was a superb and wonderful day. So thanks very, very much. So let's begin our, our second day of, of conversation, deliberation, and, and learning and sharing. And I'm very pleased today to introduce to you Jeffrey Cooper. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Cooper is Vice President for Government and Community Affairs uh, at the University of Pennsylvania. And he previously served in the administration of Governor Edward Rendell as the Chief Counsel for the Pennsylvania System of Higher Education, and Executive Deputy General Counsel for the Governor. <coughs> And most important about Jeff is he's a 1975 graduate of Penn Law School. Uh, so we have continuing the, the Penn graduates speaking to you. Who oh, you were here, they get, they get us back here. It's that Franklin spirit, you know, it brings us back, brings us back. As Vice President for Government and Community Affairs, Jeff leads the university's efforts to build constructive relationships with government officials, community groups, and other stakeholders. The Netter Center, as was discussed yesterday with SA, uh, when it was presented by Roger Smith, is housed in the Office of Government Affairs and I at the President's Center. And as I could not be more pleased to work with Jeff, and I can't be more pleased of Jeff's support and leadership in helping the Netter Center grow. So since he's come here, which was about Nine years ago now, Jeff, you're still a rookie, but with here nine years ago, um, uh, the center has grown and developed tremendously. So my friend, Jeff Cooper. Ira, some of us have reached an age where you can leave the date of graduation off of <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you, it's a, a real privilege to be here. And um, on behalf of the university and President Amy Gutman, um, I wanna welcome the, um, the presidents, the administration, the faculty, and I know some students um, and others, representatives of other organizations committed to uh, community engagement and community impact through university efforts. Uh, this is uh, an important program for us um, it is consistent with President Gutman's Compact 2020, in which local engagement is one of the key components that she recognizes as um, a, a critical aspect of a university's um, efforts and involvement in the community. Uh, we, as you know, Ira developed the con worked in, on developing the concept of university-assisted community schools. It's become a model not only in Philadelphia, where the community school movement has is really expanding, but now really across the country. So um, I want to go off script a little bit um, and not do a typical introduction really for two points. One is um, I personally want to thank Ira and the Netter Center staff, um, Joanne, Corey, Rita, Tina, everyone else that works with Ira at the Netter Center. Um, they are truly role models for everyone at the university in thinking about the role of a university, the role of an anchor institution, and what a university's responsibility is in a community, as well as how it can fulfill that responsibility. And I know you are all inspired by Ira and the Netter Center work, and I just want to thank him and ask you to thank him as well for what he does and, um, and for what the Netter Center does. So. Um, my second, my second off-script message is um, as important as what you're doing here to yesterday and today is, and as important as it is to go back to your campuses and tell your colleagues about what you've learned and find ways to implement what you've learned on your campuses. Um, we are at a time when I think it's equally important 
for you to go back to your campuses and your local communities and either pick up the phone or get on your computer email and let your members of Congress know that what they are doing in Washington right now is not acceptable. Um, as Ira said, my job is, uh, among my responsibilities are, is government relations, and um, this has been a difficult week, and I actually have to leave right away to get on some phone calls on strategy among the higher education community about how to deal with this. And as a nonprofit, we are, of course, not supposed to be partisan. I can't tell you exactly what to say or what to do. But I will tell you that what I do and what I think is that letting your Democrat and Republican representatives know, but especially the Republicans, um, especially Republicans in urban areas, um, letting them know that what's, what they're voting on will make graduate student education far more expensive and virtually impossible for many of our graduate students, that not allowing the deduction of tuition benefits that many universities provide to their employees and their families, the, 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 um, the effort to reduce the number of people who can benefit from charitable tax deductions, which will have a direct impact on many of your programs, eliminating the ta or imposing a tax on endowments, which support many of the programs that uh, we have here, particularly for the larger universities, which use their endowments most effectively, as Penn does for uh, providing scholarships, uh, re eliminating the interest on bonds that many of our universities use for construction that help drive our local economies. It's the, that construction work that employs people in our community, that helps us develop job training programs. Um, as well as eliminating deductions for medical expenses. Um, and my favorite is keeping in the deduction for expenses for businesses that transfer workers overseas. I think you should call your Congress people, email them, not just on behalf of the university, but on behalf of yourselves. It's the volume of individual voices that beat back the original efforts to do away with Obamacare. It's the volume of individual voices and voters that maybe will sway enough people to uh, vote against what's going on in Washington now. And it, uh, and as I said, the work you all do is critical. It's critical in every community. Um, but what's going on in Washington can really impair that. And I encourage you all to take steps, whatever steps you can, to talk to your representatives uh, in Washington and let them know how you feel. So with that, I, uh, again, commend all of you for the work you do. I thank you, and I thank the Netter Center uh, here at Penn. I hope you have a second terrific day of uh, talking and learning from each other. And welcome to Penn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff, for that impassioned uh, statement and, and to our colleagues. And good luck today in the work you're doing. And uh, I want to thank you again for all your support. And with that, I want to, uh, in fact, have our colleagues on the first panel to join me on stage and to uh, begin, begin getting ready to present the kickoff plenary panel for today. Thank you all very much. I know I, I'm backing up for yours. Oh, are we in some order? Are you? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Robert Jones, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the Chancellor of the University of Illinois. I've been in Champaign for about 14 months now. And uh, this is a great pleasure for me to be here. I think for the second time in about two or three years, uh, our participating in this wonderful dialogue and this wonderful conversation. Uh, in case you saw an earlier version of this panel or this uh, 
the moderator for this panel. I am not James Harris III, nor the first, nor the second. <laughs> I'm not at San Diego. I'm Robert Jones of Illinois. Uh, but uh, as it turned out, I was supposed to be on the panel yesterday, and because of this thing called Boards of Trustees that I think some of you have heard of, I could not be here, and I was very pleased that Ira asked me to fill in uh, for Dr. Harris as the moderator of this session. He uh, was. Primarily because it's a subject area that I care deeply about, and actually in all candor, not to give you my history uh, uh, verse by verse, but I would not be standing here as the leader of one of the largest uh, public land-grant research universities in the country if it had not been for the fact that I was in my lab back in 1986 minding my own business and when someone from the president's office called and asked me to be on a task force to look at the issue of how uh, the university's lack of diversity, this was in University of Minnesota at the time, uh, was getting in the way of it achieving its goal of educating the masses. Uh, that task force led to me uh, being, uh, ultimately being an associate vice president in the Office of Multicultural Affairs, where I helped shape the diversity agenda for University of Minnesota for the better part of uh, 34 years. And then during that same time period, uh, because it was the time period where uh, the Civil Rights Act you know, was signed in 1964 and higher education institutions start to think about diversity and inclusion as a strategic opportunity. You know, not just some social good, but as a strategic opportunity. So this, is, this topic that my colleagues will be discussing today is something that has shaped my life for the better part of the last 35, 36 years. And the other part of the discussion is going to focus on something that's also dear to me, and that is public engagement. What does it mean to be an engaged university? What does it mean to be an anchor in your community and not only going into community leveraging the assets and knowledge of the university, but how do you treat the community as partners? How do you leverage their knowledge and combine with combination with the knowledge from the university to solve some of the grand challenges in our community, in our society. So I'm very, uh, not happy that uh, Dr. Harris couldn't be here, but I'm very pleased that it worked out uh, for me to have a chance to uh, moderate this very distinguished panel that has representation from both public, private, and different types of higher education institutions. So we're very pleased to uh, welcome today uh, John DeGoya, the president of Georgetown University and Phoebe A. Haddon, the Chancellor of Rutgers University at Camden, Eduardo Padron, the President of Miami Dade College, and of course, uh, Dr. Jay Perman, the President of the University of Maryland, Baltimore. So we have asked each of the panelists to give some opening comments for about 10 minutes to shape their perspective from a pet presidential perspective about these critical issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion and of course public engagement. So uh, we hope to have a bit of time at the end for some engagement with you in a question and answer process as well. So again, thank you for allowing me to be here today. Well, thank you very much, Chancellor Jones. And good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all to be a part of today's conversation with with my fellow panelists, and I want to thank the University of Pennsylvania for welcoming us and to providing this opportunity to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the Netter Center, its remarkable work, especially its efforts to partner with and support communities in West Philadelphia. Our colleges and universities have a unique contribution to make to our nation in the formation of our young people and the creation and critique of knowledge and in the work we, that we do to advance the common good. The Netter Center is an extraordinary example of what is possible when this mission is alive within a university community. When leaders like Ira Harkavy illuminate and engage with the responsibilities of a university to develop and sustain our democracy. As the work of this center was being established, Ira and I were reminiscing just a few moments ago. We go back more than 30 years Georgetown was privileged to host IRA in the, in the early 1990s 
and to learn from the extraordinary work that he was seeking to build here at Penn. So for me, it's just a wonderful opportunity to be here and to celebrate this very special occasion. The planners of this, uh, of this panel asked if I would tell a story about some recent work at Georgetown, and I'm happy to do that. Over the past two years, we've been on a very, very important journey as a university community. And I hope by sharing our story, I can help speak to the importance of places like the Netter Center and of our shared American story. So every fall, I teach a first year seminar. Last fall, the topic was justice. And early in the semester, our students and I, we read a book by a Cornell professor, an alum, that we share with the University of Pennsylvania. Edward Baptist did his undergraduate degree at Georgetown. He did his PhD here at Penn. He wrote a book just a few years ago called The Half Has Never Been Told. Slavery and the Making of American Capitalism. We read the book, and then as a group, we visited the new Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, which at the time had only been open a week. I had planned it many months in advance. <laughs> I don't think anyone knew what it was they were promising when they promised that. Well, we could do that, sure. Uh, oh, it was fantastic. But one of, the, one of the students in the seminar came into class. We, we visited on a, on a Sunday afternoon. And on Monday morning, we had our seminar. And one student came to the seminar that next day. And she, and she had described another experience she had had over the weekend. The day before our visit to the new museum, she on her own went to the Smithsonian Museum of American History. And she told our, our, our seminar, I'm having a very difficult time reconciling these two experiences. Well, more than ever before, thanks in large part to the extraordinary scholarship, the art, the witness of today's academics, filmmakers and activists, we're confronted with truths that require us to re-examine, even rewrite our American story. We've we have to come to terms with, in Edward Baptist's words, the half that has never been told, both as a country and as universities. So let me begin with a brief overview of our Georgetown story. We were founded in 1789 as the nation's first Catholic institution of higher learning on land which was then in Maryland. At the time, Maryland was the one state that permitted religious freedom for Catholics. It was also a slave state. There were slaves on the Georgetown campus. More significantly, we were connected to a decision in 1838 when 272 enslaved children, women, and men were sold from four plantations owned by the Jesuit order of the Catholic Church in Southern Maryland. As the most significant project for the Jesuits in Maryland, our university benefited from the sale. We received $17,000. It's equal to approximately a half a million dollars today. And that was sent to Georgetown following the sale. Now we've known this story. We've taught this story. In the 90s, one of our very first digital websites placed the documents of the sale online as part of a seminar that we taught in American Studies. But a few years ago, a number of very important factors led us to examine this part of our history anew. In August of 2014, following the death of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, like, like many of you, we organized a community conversation on the first day of school. We weren't sure what to expect, but we thought it was important to try to anticipate the need for dialogue. More than 700 students came to that, to that event. And we recognized that we tapped into something and we needed to create a framework 
to engage and explore questions of racial justice in our community. At that same time, we were renovating an old building on our campus, a building known as the Old Jez Res, which had previously served as the residence of our Jesuit community. We built a new home. We we're about to renovate this old building right in the heart of our campus. The building did have a name, one that had been forgotten, but the name was Milady Hall, named for Thomas Milady, a former president of Georgetown, who after he had served, was responsible as a leader within the Jesuit order for the sale of the 272 enslaved children, women, and men in his capacity as the provincial, the leader of the Jesuit order in Maryland at the time. In August of 2015, after careful consultation with our community, I announced the creation of a working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation. And throughout that academic year, the working group, faculty, staff, students, alumni, brought our community into engagement with our history. We were inspired by the leadership of Ruth Simmons, who had pioneered an examination of Brown University's historical ties to slavery in 2003. And with the scholarship of Craig Stephen Wilder, the author of Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of American Universities. Public manifestations of racism and violence across the country have underscored the urgency of the work taking place on our own campus and called us to go further. So in early 2016, we launched a second working group focused on racial justice and our responses as a university community. We committed ourselves to establishing a new department for African American studies, new faculty hires, a new research center on racial justice issues. By the fall of 2016, our working group on slavery, memory, and reconciliation, a year after it was, was established, released its report providing a roadmap for our university's ongoing and long-term engagement with our history. We have since renamed two buildings on our campus. One honors Isaac Hawkins, the enslaved person whose name is mentioned first in the 1838 documents of the sale. The second building for Anne Marie Beecraft, a free woman of color who founded a school for black girls in the neighborhood of Georgetown in 1827. We held a special religious service during which Georgetown and the Jesuits offered a formal apology for our historical participation in slavery and we dedicated the buildings with more than 100 descendants of, of the women and men who were enslaved and sold in 1838 in attendance. When we began this work, we would not have presumed that descendants would want to establish a connection with Georgetown. Once it became clear that this was important, we began outreach and we've been honored to build relationships with these members of our community. We continue this engagement today. Some of the recommendations from the working group dealt explicitly with ways we might memorialize and make amends for historical events. Others explored how our university could address the legacy of slavery and segregation present in our nation today. These recommendations align with some of our deepest and most long-standing commitments for the past four decades. In particular, these past four decades, we have been challenged and inspired by the call of the leader from 1966 to 1983, the leader of the Jesuit order, Father Pedro Arupe, who led the Jesuits in the 15 years following the Second Vatican Council, Father Arupe's challenge to everyone working within Jesuit institutions was this, are you equal to the demands of justice in our world? And as a university community, we have tried to wrestle with, the, with this challenge of incorporating into the mission of a university, the mission of social justice. And for us, this commitment has taken several forms over the course of these years. 
1968, we launched what would become what we call today our Community Scholars Program with the goal of enrolling and supporting students of low-income backgrounds. Today, this, is, this program serves primarily those who are first in their family to attend college, primarily students of color. Just a few years later, in 1978, we established the commitment to need blind, full need, our financial aid and admissions policies. Our Georgetown Scholarship Program supports ongoing support for nearly 1,400 of our students. We sought to recognize how we could better address our responsibilities to the District of Columbia. And again, the kind of work that, that IRA was so, so helpful to us as we wrestled with the development of what we now call our Center for, for Social Justice at Georgetown, which connects Georgetown students with youth and adults throughout the Washington, D.C. area, providing direct services such as tutoring and mentoring. Our law center, their clinics and in institutes work in a variety of settings. And our medical center, uh, most recently, uh, Dr. Dr. Christopher, Christopher King of our School of Nursing and Health Studies compiled a deep report on health disparities in the District of Columbia. We know we have a lot of work to do. I know this gathering today is a recognition of how important this work is and what we all hope to accomplish. Through all this work, some of which is new, some of which has been a part of our community for decades, we're seeking to see how we can continually reimagine what it means to be authentic to our identity for Georgetown as a Catholic and Jesuit university, also as an institution of higher learning and as a, an important institution in our, in our United States of America. We recognize that we need to re-examine and where, re where relevant, reconstruct and rewrite our story as we both understand and appreciate elements in new ways. Again, it's an honor to be here, particularly with my dear friend Ira Harkavy and with my wonderful colleagues here on this panel. And it's an honor to be with all of you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Once again, I want to uh, express my appreciation to Ira and to the Netter Center for bringing us together for such an important uh, mission that we have all embraced. Uh, you know, we have to agree that this room is full of converts, uh, people who come together because we believe in what this Senate represents and the agenda that has been put together. Um, I'm also very pleased to have been placed with such distinguished uh, colleagues uh, on this panel. Uh, Jack, that was a very powerful account of history, especially for Georgetown University, which I think provides uh, a, a fantastic background for the discussion that we're supposed to have here today on uh, diversity, inclusion, and, and engagement. I don't have prepared remarks, but I want to take a couple of brief moments to basically uh, review a, a couple of aspects of history that I think have implications for the discussion today. And for a minute or two, I'd like for us to transport ourselves into the 20th century. Uh, and think about significant events during that time that basically have a lot to do with the discussion today. Number one, if you think about the last century uh, and the role of America in the world, and uh, you think about American economy and uh, how we related to each other how we went to work, how we maintain our families. Uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, most Americans in the 20th century with little education uh, could go to work into mostly factories and offices and do mostly manual work 
repetitive task and frankly earn a good wage that would allow them to join the middle class, uh, which is the definition of the American dream. Uh, this was uh, possible and most Americans could stay in a job for about 30 years, uh, buy a home, and um, in the process retire with a good pension. And uh, most Americans were able to do that, and our middle class grew. And uh, it was during that century, about 100 years ago, when a decision, a wise decision was made after a lot of arguments and discussion about the importance of making high school a universal right for every citizen. So let's move now a little bit into the 21st century. And the situation is really quite different. Uh, as we move into the 21st century, along with what we know as a technological revolution, call it uh, different ways, have been described by economists and others. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that today, uh, most of the jobs that were accessible to most Americans in the 21st century have been disappearing. The impact of technology uh, and the nature of work today is very different and continues to change at a very rapid pace. And what makes the difference is that while in the 20th century we could afford to have just a few access colleges and universities, precisely because they had different ways of earning their wages, etc. cetera, uh, today that has become not only a necessity but an imperative. Today, a college credential, a college degree it's the only way that Americans are able to achieve middle class status and to be able to achieve the American dream. The fact of the matter is that if they don't do that, if they just have a high school diploma today, most chances are they're gonna stay in a cycle of poverty for the rest of their lives. And what is the implication of that for the topic that we are about to discuss here today about access, <coughs> diversity, inclusion, and engagement? Well, it's very relevant because the responsibility that we educators, that we members of higher education have in terms of making sure that all citizens in this country have the opportunity to achieve the American dream is directly related to what we do. Is directly related to the access that we're able to provide to citizens to get the kind of education, the knowledge and the skills to be able to provide for themselves and their families. And the picture is not really very good. And what we do in order to change that and to be able to make our doors more open and more accessible, it's important. And um, one of the things that continues to worry me <coughs> is the fact that <coughs> people are looking at us today and there are all kind of criticisms <coughs> because of what we fail to do or do. And uh, I believe that one of the things that is an imperative for us is to really reconsider, again, how we change the dynamics. Some of us are doing a better job than others. I think we have great examples here today. As a matter of fact, most of the institutions that are represented here are great examples of the significant efforts that are taking place. But if we don't, we will very well deserve the title that some have already given us of engines of inequality by just allowing a certain group of people with the resources, etc., to uh, be able to access the university <coughs> as opposed to, to the masses. Uh, this, in my opinion, is key to this discussion, is key to every discussion that has taken place here uh, yesterday 
and, uh, and today. You know, in the age of innovation, not only the access is important, but what we teach the students is equally important or perhaps more important. Because the skills that the students need to have today in order to be able to be successful in our present economy, those that require collaboration, critical thinking, that requires students to become problem solvers is, is essential. And I know many of the universities in this country, by the way, the best universities in the world. They were before and they still are. <coughs> but the fact of the matter is that for America to really continue to be the economic power and the whole idea of social justice that we as a nation embrace, we have to make sure that we provide opportunities for all, for all the citizens. I think if we become incubators of inclusion, if we allow our institutions to be dream factories where all kind of people can come and achieve their full potential, where we harness the full potential on every citizen. Many of us believe that talent is universal, but the problem is that opportunity is not. And when we open the door of opportunity to many of the students that are there begging for that chance, wonderful things happen. At my institution, we learned that a long time ago. We're an open door institution. So the students who come to us, many of them come and prepare for college to start with. <coughs> We don't give ourselves the luxury to selecting students on the basis of high GPAs, high SATs, or families that have the means to pay whatever we ask for. In order to serve the people that we care to serve, we need to make sure our institution is affordable and that we offer the highest possible quality education for them. And as a result of that, yes, we face tremendous challenges. The one that I mentioned is that, the first one is that they not all come prepared for college. As a matter of fact, over two thirds of my students show deficiencies in basic skills. Could be just one or several skills, math, reading, basic language. And what you do with them, it's important. Because if we were to close the, the, uh, the doors on the, on the majority of the students who come to us, probably there will be no other institution that will take them. They will be on the streets, they will be depending on government and welfare, they will be part of the crime scene, they will be dealing with drugs, they will actually be a recipe for social trouble. And uh, so that's, that's the profile. And the profile is even more inclusive than that because about 67% of my students are low income. 45% live in poverty. You know, I don't care what people say, but poverty matters. My students, <coughs> as, as low as my tuition is, have difficulty paying for that tuition. And when they do, just simple things such as having to go to an emergency room or an increasing rent is enough to make them drop out of school. Half of the language of half of my students, is English is not the native language of those students. Many of them uh, come from first generation, they are first generation college students, very similar to what you experience at some of your institutions. But what I'm saying is the, committee, the commitment of the faculty and the staff at that institution has made it possible to create a culture of success that allowed those students to be embraced, to give them the idea that, uh, that failure is not an option, and to fact, the fact that they understand that the only ticket to a better life is the degree that they will be able to accomplish if they follow the rules. Now, that work, it's a the work that my faculty has embraced. It's not easy work, especially for public institutions 
where you have public elected officials who believe that education is an expense, not an investment, who continue to decrease the funding that we get every year. But the perseverance and the commitment to provide those students that opportunity is very much alive. So as a result of that, we are an institution that you couldn't find a more diverse institution in America today, in more ways than one. It's an institution that basically, ethnically, and in every other respect, uh, is a microcosm of the community. And the results are wonderful. This is the city of Miami. And when you look at the city of Miami today, and you look at leadership everywhere, what you're going to find is that an open door institution that embraced people like me, because that's an institution that gave me my first opportunity when I needed to go to college, are, are the people who are leading industry, government, and everything else in, the, in that city. Uh, from the people who represent us in Congress, to the mayor, to the state attorney, the public defender, the head of the major hospitals, the major developers, et cetera, et cetera. And these are people like me would tell you that it had not been because of that institution. <clears throat> they would not be there doing what they are doing. And what I'm saying is that there are many other institutions throughout this nation that have proven the same thing. But it's not enough. We still have to make sure that we as institutions provide the open door for diversity, for inclusion, and that we're committed to build communities. I feel that that's something that we all have in common here. We realize how important it is for us not to continue to be labeled the ivory tower, that we're part of the solution of the community problems, that we're there working hand in hand, actually applying the knowledge that we accumulate at our institutions on behalf of the communities that we serve. That's what's gonna make America great. That's what's really gonna make us the bastions of the future. And I thank you for the opportunity to be here with you today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, first, I want to say that I really uh, am sorry that I was not able to come yesterday. Uh, it's a wonderful program, and I know that my fellow chancellor from Rutgers, Nancy Cantor, gave an excellent talk. Uh, it is my pleasure to be a part of this panel, uh, some of whom uh, were part of the panel last year, and Ira, thank you very much for inviting us to, again. Uh, I uh, want to uh, incorporate by reference, because I'm a lawyer, uh, all of the things that have been said by our panelists uh, already, and so I'll hit the floor running on some of the things that I wanted to talk about in particular. So a 2017 report by the Institute for Higher Education Policy illustrates how increases in college costs are hurting less affluent Americans, undercutting our basic ideas of opportunity, equal quality, and fairness. Uh, while students in the highest income quintile could pay for admission at 90% of the institutions surveyed, lower and even moderate income students could afford less than 5% of these schools. That's a terrible, terrible thing and predicament to be in. Thus, like many other research universities of our size, and we're small and agile, Rutgers Camden its commitment is to be even more responsive to the increasing diversity and social mobility of our location and to create a publicly engaged citizenry uh, in the place we live and work. We know that given the realities of our current social, economic, and political climate, universities, universities must redouble their commitment to serving the public good. Higher education must prepare students for graduation uh, and into careers, but we also must create leaders who will confront and help address our social ills and to be good citizens <coughs> in the final analysis. We need to create engaged students 
who understand and believe in democratic principles on which this country was founded. And with changing demographics in the United States, including an increasing number of students of color, higher education must be prepared to serve student bodies with diverse needs and outlooks. Rutgers Camden has chosen to realize this guiding mission as part of our land grant institution obligations, while also making a positive impact on its host city and the overall Delaware Valley region. We do so with a commitment to ensure that those who seek access to higher education have a pathway for success. So this is what sets us apart. We are and always have been a place of access for first generation college students. This is not new. For me, that's an equalizing force that shatters the notion of access as a stereotype, a notion that all of us should fight against, I believe. This form of access is how those of us who are land-grant universities can remain faithful to the spirit of our mission, but it is also how every college and university today, public or private, land-grant or religious, should serve our society. So our um, prototype, our poster boy, uh, is Walt McDonnell. He's the president of ETS, many of you know. He's also a model of how a university degree can change the life of a first generation student. Walt was doing manual labor when a friend suggested, you know, you ought to try taking a college course. A Rutgers professor mentored Walt, and not only did he earn his bachelor's, but went on to get a PhD. He wrote the very first AP exam for biology, and now he heads up ETS. All of our schools have stories like Walt's. We tell these stories because they have resonance, but we need to internalize Walt's story. This outcome, a first generation student rising up, this is the true mark of equality that higher education institutions must promote. At Rutgers Camden, obviously, we have many programs that seek to increase access and diversity for and among our students, and particularly today for students of color. We know that reaching college is challenging for many first generation students, but it's also especially so for those students. While the number of Hispanic, black, white, and Asian, uh, Asian adult United States residents with a high school degree has grown, that gap in those attaining bachelor's degrees has actually decreased, uh, increased for both black and Hispanic students when compared with those white students. So according to the Institute of Higher Education report that I referred to earlier, the gap in undergraduate degree attainment has actually doubled from 9 to 20 percent for Hispanic students since 1974 and from 6 to 13 percent for black adults since 1964. Rutgers Camden is seeking to address this problem by making college accessible and affordable through our nationally recognized Bridging the Gap program, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, at Rutgers Law School, the Rutgers Law School, which is uh, housed both at Newark as well as in Camden, the Minority Students Program that addresses the underrepresentation of minorities in law schools and in the legal profession offers a specialized recruitment and retention effort. We provide a summer institute for incoming students in this program, and we continue that support throughout their law school careers. Now, many law schools have started doing this uh, across the country, but I want to acknowledge that Rutgers Newark was the very first place uh, to invite, have that kind of program, and as part of the Rutgers Law School today, Rutgers and Camden both are providing that kind of support. We all know that not every path to a bachelor's degree is a straight line from high school into college. The Rutgers Law School, uh, uh, the Rutgers Nursing School partners with Cooper Hospital in Camden on a collaborative for upward mobility that helps hospital employees from underrepresented groups to achieve their bachelor's in nursing. These are just a few examples of the student success focused approach that we have taken, including having a student success uh, ch chancellor level position um, that has just come into place and Jason Rivera is going to join our team as part of that success effort. Uh, we know that it's necessary, very vital 
to have the opportunity for our students uh, to actually uh, not be concerned about debt. Uh, and so what we have done is created this Bridging the Gap program. Um, and it is now um, being experienced across all of New Jersey. Uh, and through that, we seek to have students not to have to worry about their um, problems uh, with uh, stu accumulating student debt, but rather focus on their, their college work and not have to uh, go to outside work opportunities in order to actually survive on campus. Uh, so this program works at Rutgers Camden in particular uh, because of our size. Uh, we're not as large as Rutgers Newark uh, uh, or Rutgers New Brunswick, for example, uh, which has 55,000 students to our 7,000 or so. Uh, we maximize our class schedules and uh, we can utilize space inventory to accommodate extra uh, student growth as well as to create extra sections that will accommodate this growth. So our Bridging the Gap program um, allows us to also be nimble and calibrate the program to better serve our students. So when we first launched the program, we had only two adjusted gross income categories, with the second providing 50% coverage. Uh, later, we realized that families in the lower end uh, really were still struggling. So we created a new band, 60,000 to 80,000. We now cover 75% of that tuition delta within the brand. So we're widening access based on economic drivers, and at the same time, we're increasing equity across a wide spectrum of metrics. The outcomes from our Bridging the Gap class, which entered in 2016, are impressive. We knew we'd see an increase in our first generation, first time undergraduate population, but our enrollment increased dramatically for African Americans and Hispanic students. Uh, this student population, we know, will need increased vigilance in terms of retention and uh, recruitment. And so we have to require and do think it's critically important to have a structure in which they feel supported. So we now created an Office of Diversity and Inclusion this fall. It addresses race, it addresses gender, uh, but it also addresses religion and sexual identity <clears throat> and other areas of common concern for these students. We serve our student veterans with a commitment that has earned Rutgers Camden the status as New Jersey's only Purple Heart University. Uh, and we have federal programs and state programs uh, which in effect allow our students to thrive under bridging the gap. <coughs> Excuse me. Recruitment and retention are key pillars to building equity. We all know that. Uh, there's one more critical uh, link for us and that is that we have to build a pipeline uh, from elementary school uh, to convey to all students that an a, a, an a college degree uh, is within their reach. And so at Rutgers Camden, our civic engagement initiatives are focused on K through 12. Uh, they include a number of programs that are mentioned on the slide. Uh, and uh, it gives the message that we are uh, hardwired into the DNA of everything we do that is committed to supporting Camden and its environment. Our commitment to the city uh, also enables us to reach across community leaders and partnerships across uh, the, the uh, Southern Jersey uh, area. On this slide, uh, I list some of the, the uh, programs that we deliver, uh, but uh, we also have university-assisted community schools that are modeled uh, right uh, here uh, uh, along with the Netter Center's uh, focus on after-school programs, college access, and civic learning. Uh, in short, we want to develop a, a pipeline that is uh, critical and supportive of the work that we do. Um, we have found that students in our civic engagement courses are more likely to graduate on time. This is especially true for our first-generation students who participate in these courses. And additionally, we have found that our first generation students who do not participate in high impact courses have lower graduation rates. Uh, Rutgers Camden's civic engagement is more than an action plan. It's an ethos and our faculty and our students support all of this. Uh, we really uh, are of the belief that our anchor, as an anchor institution, we have to make sure 
uh, that uh, Camden K through 12 uh, is the place and economic driver of our city. And so uh, our legal clinics also offer support <coughs> to our um, students as well as the community that surrounds us. We're not just a higher education place in short. Uh, we're a full partner in Camden Rising. Uh, Camden anchors our Eds and Meds corridor. We are a part of Cooper's Ferry Development Organization. I sit on the board of Cooper Hospital and the President's Council of the Economy League of Philadelphia. In sum, uh, Rutgers, is, Rutgers is an active partner across the region. We know that economic prosperity occurs only with a well-educated workforce and our ability to educate our students requires a flexibility that uh, never has been uh, embraced before. It is being embraced now in academe. Access and equity are more than buzzwords for us. They are the characteristics by which universities will rise or fall in the 21st century. I invite you to come visit Rutgers Camden and see what we are doing. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk today about our work. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Chancellor Jones. Ira, I listened uh, carefully to your introduction of Vice President Jeff Cooper. Uh, I realized in your remarks that uh, value is given to having a Penn legacy. Uh, I want to point out that my son is a proud <coughs> graduate of Penn. And I have a daughter and a son-in-law who are faculty at Penn. So I hope that establishes my bona fides. Uh, distinguished panelists, uh, all of us who are uh, colleagues in this important work, it's my honor to uh, share a, a few comments and stories. Uh, but I must begin with congratulations uh, to Dr. Ira Harkavy and really everyone here at the Netter Center on these 25 years of excellence. Uh, you must know, you must know that you inspire the rest of us. So thank you. Uh, you've shown all of us uh, the vital importance of community engagement, uh, how to do it right. The way in which diversity and inclusion intersect with community engagement is an interesting and important topic for the University of Maryland Baltimore because of our Carnegie classification as a spe special focus institution. We are somewhat different from the institutions of my colleagues. Uh, UMB is Maryland's only public health, law, and human services university. We have six professional schools, medicine, nursing, <coughs> pharmacy, dentistry, law, social work, as well as an interdisciplinary graduate school. And among our students, 27% are underrepresented minorities. Now, in comparison to like institutions, which principally house professional schools in the health sciences and law, we generally exceed the national average in that diversity metric. But that doesn't mean we are free of a problem, not by any means. Yeah, we recruit the best and brightest from all races and from all over the country. But I'll tell you where they're not <coughs> coming from, from our own backyard from what you see at the bottom of the screen, uh, West Baltimore. In fact, from the communities that lay in the shadows of our 71 acres on the west side of Baltimore's downtown. I'm very proud of Baltimore, and yet we have our challenges. You all know about Baltimore. <clears throat> so I'll tell you about the neighborhood that sits 
closest to our campus, just across Martin Luther King Boulevard. In the Poppleton Hollins Market neighborhood, cheek by jowl with our campus, nearly two thirds of children live in poverty. And the comparator circles are the rest of Baltimore, not the nation, the rest of Baltimore. The average life expectancy is 68 years. That's 20 years shorter than the life expectancy in the city's wealthy northern neighborhoods. 20 years difference, you don't need statistical tests. And despite years of robust outreach and engagement in West Baltimore, the children who live there, at just a mile or two away from campus, almost never make it to us as students. And we consider that unacceptable. It's our community. So I want to talk in the time I have about just one of our programs intended to bridge that divide. And I've reported to some of this audience in the past about it. It's our UMB Cure Scholars Program. The UMB Cure Scholars Program was inspired by an NIH program in the National Cancer Institute, the NCI, a program operated under the NCI Center to reduce cancer health disparities. In 2014, we attracted NCI support to pilot a version of their Cure program, which is a highly successful program designed to cultivate a diverse biomedical research workforce. CURE stands for them as the uh, continuing umbrella of research experiences. Well, that national program under the <coughs> NIH deploys mentors who serve as a resource to scholars of color throughout their college undergraduate and graduate training and into their first academic position. And they've had a modicum of success. But what they and others who administer pipelines continually say is that the pool is just not large enough. So how is our program different? We wanted to start building a diverse healthcare workforce in Baltimore, for Baltimore and beyond. But we decided that we couldn't wait until college to do it not even close. For too many, college is too late. <coughs> High school is too late. So we decided to target middle schoolers so that we could patch the breaches, if you will, in the pipeline early, before the holes get too big. And we partnered with our University of Maryland Greenbaum Comprehensive Cancer Center in the fall of 2015 we inducted our first cohort of sixth graders into the program. We selected three middle schools in West Baltimore where we already had close relationships established. We interviewed the students. We asked about their interest in science, their commitment to the program. That was our baseline criteria, not whether their grades were the highest in the class or whether their test scores were better than the other students. It was whether they understood that they were making a commitment, that they were taking on a responsibility, and whether it was something they really wanted. And it turns out that they did. We're into year three of our program. And despite all of the issues around them, 31 of 38 of our year one scholars are still with us. And I'd like to introduce you to some of them. What you're going to see is the trailer to a documentary that aired on Maryland Public Television last month. In my neighborhood, you have to know where you can, cannot go. One of my classmates actually lives across the street from me. I would love to go over to his house and play games one day, but I can't do that. It's not really safe to go outside that much. Someone actually got shot last year and murdered in front of our door. And since then, I've been wary about them going outside to play. And bullets fly, and 
you don't know who it's going to hit. So instead of us putting ourselves in that position, I'd rather just stay in the house. And the one that got shot, I knew who he was. I'm about to be 15. You know, like you get around 15, 16, that's when everything really start to change. Please start treating you different because of like the way I look. Because I'm because I'm, I'm black, so they automatically they might assume that I have a weapon, or if I try to put my hands up, they might just shoot me. And you gotta watch out, watch what you do because split second things can get you locked up or killed. I always tell him, you're a black man. You can't just go out. You just can't hang out in the street. I'm determined to get out of Baltimore. I was so bad. I used to run the halls. I just didn't do what I was supposed to do. I lived in the principal's office for about two or three years. I had to go to the principal's office because I was main a disturbance. I was being a very bad me. And he doesn't know that he's getting this, but he actually won Scholar of the Year, Shakir Franklin. <laughs> The sky is the limit to where I go. We Baltimore, we, we a city, like we a strong city. I believe the world doesn't determine what you have to do. It You determine what you want to do. I think that I control my destiny. We have seen enough violence. It's time to start doing good stuff. I want to come back to Baltimore and help instead of just leaving it in poverty. Baltimore is changing. And I'm here to ready to change water. Mm -hmm. Six of our scholars, we now have. <laughs> we now have 80 scholars uh, in grades six to eight. And from here on out, uh, we're aiming for 25 scholars per cohort, understanding happily that our attrition isn't what we thought it would be. Right now, we have a 93% retention rate among our year two scholars. Twice a week, the scholars come to our campus after school for intensive tutoring and for science and social activities on Saturdays and over the summer. They're on campus all day, on campus, in our classrooms, laboratories, operatories, interacting with our faculty and researchers. This year, we have three curricular tracks that scholars can choose among a robotics track, an anatomy track, and a STEM track in which we partner uh, with our colleagues at the Applied Physics Lab at Johns Hopkins. Plus, we're teaming up with Sylvan and Kaplan to get the scholars ready for their PSATs and SATs. At the end of year two, we had a 93% attendance rate at after-school activities. For Saturday activities, nearly an 88% attendance rate. Our eighth graders are off to high school next year and we've signed agreements with three of the city's premier science high schools. They've agreed to hold seats for our scholars in each incoming ninth grade class. The reason our scholars have struck, stuck with this program, the reason they show up day in and day out, is that we've assembled around them a deep community of support. Right now, we have approximately 250 mentors, UMB students, faculty, staff, friends of the program, they come from all seven of our professional and graduate schools. And of course, because most of them are students, it's a mentor pool that we have to keep replenishing as our professional students graduate. And even with this natural attrition, after year two, we had an 86% mentor retention rate. The mentors are deeply invested in these students, in their lives, in their success. Look, the program requires a significant sacrifice of time and effort from them. They sacrifice. We do have some data on achievement. Uh, I can't tell you how many have gone to medical school. I hope I'll be around. Uh, but uh, more than 60% of our scholars across the three schools we're engaged with have improved significantly their standardized math scores, uh, 
and uh, you know, uh, making up that 60%, there's some compelling individual stories. One of our scholars started the program two years ago with math at being done at below a third grade level. And in just two years' time, her score has climbed 154 points. Uh, she's doing math at a sixth grade level. Uh, and uh, I have to say, that particular scholar, in that two-year span, her family moved a couple of times. She's endured tragedy, trauma, and violence that I will not share with you. Uh, but she stayed in our partner school because she's committed to the CURE program. More dramatically, we see a pronounced shift in what the scholars want for their future. Again, anecdotes. Two years ago when we asked the scholars what they wanted to be when they grew up, we had a lot of singers and basketball players and hairdressers and NFL stars. I make no judgment on that. That's not my point. It's just that it's changed. Now they want to be surgeons and scientists and inventors and pediatricians, perhaps to make me feel better. Uh, I know we have a paleontologist in the group and a NASA astronaut. At least that's what their ambitions are now. Now, as you heard, they want to help children like themselves and families like their own. And uh, in telling these stories, and I know I'm short on time, I just want to tell you about the incredible opportunities that they've had in this past year. The scholars went to the annual meeting, an international meeting, of the American Association for Cancer Research this past spring. They presented posters, like you and I might present scientific posters, uh, exploring different types of cancer that particularly uh, disequitably uh, impact the African American community. They were the first ever, I can assure you, middle schoolers to present at the meeting. Uh, one of our scholars, uh, Princea Sanders, delivered a powerful keynote at this scientific meeting on why this nation needs more physicians and scientists of color. Last summer, they presented their posters at the NIH uh, as the NIH celebrated 21 years of the CURE program. And I can tell you from personal observation, uh, seeing their confidence in these settings, their poise, uh, great life skills. Uh, the students know they're pioneers. They know that uh, the program's sustainability depends on they're making it a success early on, and they take that responsibility uh, seriously. Now, we have challenges because uh, the problems our scholars live with are complex and layered and unique and dynamic. We have to uh, work very hard to provide uh, social work support. That's a challenge for us. Uh, school mobility is a significant issue for us. It's a great threat to program retention. And housing for West Baltimore residents is unstable, it's unreliable. There may be multiple moves that these children need to endure over a single year. Uh, and uh, as with most ambitious efforts, we need to cultivate external support, philanthropic support, to keep a program like this growing because we've made promises to these children. So in closing, uh, this is a small scale program, yes. Uh, but I hope that we're on to something important, something that can be validated and scale. And now finally, how does it come back to the theme that my colleagues have so elegantly discussed before me, to the theme of diversity and inclusion at the institution? We're diverse, but I think it's initiatives like this uh, that will make it possible for us ultimately to get the kind of diversity at UMB that we need, the kind where we're judging ourselves not on numbers and percentages alone, but about who's in those numbers, about who those numbers represent, the kind that allows our neighbors to look across MLK at the big buildings and know that in every way our university is for them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, panelists. I think we all will agree that uh, we've had uh, 
very prime examples of diversity and inclusion and public engagement from these four different institutions that clearly indicate that these ideas are part of the organizing principle for these universities. It's not something on the side, it's not something at the margins. And I do believe that this approach that all of you are using is our best opportunity to restore public trust and to have real impact in communities, folks, which is part of our mission that I think a lot of institutions don't pay enough attention to. So I'd like to offer all of you again a, another round of applause for what you're doing. We have about 15 minutes left, and so uh, we're now going to try to engage in a dialogue, if you will. I'm sure there must be many questions for our panelists, so I uh, ask that you raise your hand or stand, and uh, you'll be recognized. Yes, there's a question over here. Oh, yes. Are the microphones? Yes. yes. Hi, my name is Alyssa Bigby. I work for the NETA program. Um, I just want to commend you all first for the work that you've done. It's amazing. Uh, Mr. Department, I, one thing that stood about, about your program was that you have it on campus. And uh, one of the things that came up yesterday amongst discussions were how can we make the doors swing both ways? So how do we get the universities not only to go into the community, but to get the community on the campus as well? What persuaded you to have the program on the campus? And how do you recommend um, other communities persuade the universities to do the same? Well, thank you, Alyssa, for the question. Uh, I must say that uh, you may be disappointed with my answer because uh, uh, we didn't start that way. We decided in starting the CURE program that we would uh, go out into the community and do our uh, afternoon programming on Tuesdays and Thursdays at the individual schools. And the reason I say I'm not going to give you an inspiring uh, response is that, quite frankly, uh, with generous resources but still limited, we realized that if we wanted to scale up the program, we couldn't do it that way. We needed to uh, most efficiently bring the students back to campus. So I stumbled into the fact that that was the best way to do it. We should have done it that way in the first place because the message we want to deliver is that our place is happy to have you. You are welcome in our place, apart from the fact that when they're in our place, uh, when our surgeons take them to the operating rooms or they go to the labs, uh, they're in the midst of our environment. That's what we wanted to show them in the first place. So I wish I had the wisdom to do it the right way first. I think this is the right way. Other questions? Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you very much for all of your information and huge commitments to making a difference in communities. Um, I always match questions and um, challenges to huge commitments. So this is for all of you. Uh, do you foresee um, collaboration, in particular to uh, UM UMBC, is it? UMBC? UMB. UMB, sorry. <laughs> do my you brother, Dr. Rosowski <laughs> at Do you foresee in the near future uh, collaborations with different um, schools in your in, on your campus or in your university collaboration to go after and tackle the systemic challenges that actually has uh, these schools or these neighborhoods um, be the way that they are uh, really getting to the root of and providing resources from every direction, maybe in the School of Policy, in the School of Social Work. Do you foresee in the near future any collaboration there? That's a great question. Who wants to respond? Sure, I'll, I'll be happy to. Jack? I think it's a terrific question. And also, it, it identifies the strategy that I think we've all recognized. We're not going to be able to achieve the kind of structural changes that we need in our communities unless we bring the full resources of our universities together. Um, I would say that what um, has characterized, I mentioned in, in my remarks this 40 year plus arc of really trying to, to find the most appropriate way um, to be able to uh, achieve this integration between the mission of a university and this challenge that was presented to, to our institution um, given our history and our tradition 
And this challenge, would we be equal to the demands of justice? And some of what I, I presented just briefly, the kinds of programming and the kinds of activities, the outreach, it, it really took, took um, I'd say, you know, three or four different kinds of, of approaches. You know, for our, for our undergraduates, it was volunteerism, um, engagement and service, and then what we've come to call over the, the last 30 years, service learning. For our law students, our clinics, more than anything, our clinics and then our institutes, which are sort of engaged ways of our, of our, our, our law community to be able to find different ways of being connected and engaged to communities. But our clinics have been um, part of the curriculum, in a sense, part of the, the three-year JD program. For our medical center, there's been tremendous outreach um, in, in different kinds of forms. And then we have programs similar to the, to the way that, that Jay just described theirs in terms of outreach to you know, basically rising seventh graders, bringing them to our, our community over the course of the years. But I wasn't able to go into details, uh, very similar kinds of statistics to what were described um, in Camden. Um, the, you know, the report done by Christopher King at Georgetown, our, our differences are just a little bit, little bit different. But for, for, for an African-American male in the city of Washington in 2017, the life expectancy is 15 years less than it would be for me, 15 years. And if we look at half a dozen other metrics that emerged out of this study today, and this was done out of our nursing and health, health school, Health, health studies program, but the interventions are being identified right now by our policy school, our law school, and our medical school, in addition to nursing and health studies. We're only gonna be able to address these, these deep structural dynamics in, in our economy. We, we supported a member of our faculty who was asked by the mayor to, um, to lead an effort in ass assessing this, the current state of the conditions in our city. And our, our McCourt School of Public Policy provided the kind of support for that work over the course of the last few years. Coming out of that, very similar kind of dynamics as you, you would have heard from my three colleagues in terms of housing, access to opportunities in education, in terms of, of economic opportunity. The deep structural issues that are, that are the enduring legacy of Slavery and segregation in our country, and particularly in our city, are only going to be addressed by pulling together the full resources of our institutions. Yes, Jasper. So I uh, um, mentioned K through 12. Uh, our focus is really from infancy all the way through uh, going on to graduate school. So we start out uh, with a collaboration with uh, the LEAP Academy, which is right across from our campus, uh, where they have infants. Uh, and uh, they nurture those infants. And our students work with the LEAP Academy uh, in the uh, nurturing of the infants. They go on through that academy and our other K through 12 partners. Uh, that are really uh, the place where our students work. And it's because of our civic engagement commitment that goes uh, to the heart of what we do, as I explained. Uh, we spent a long time as a faculty struggling through our strategic planning about how to characterize our commitment to civic engagement. Many people said that we shouldn't even include it as the words because it was so fundamentally a part. But we made a decision that we had to say that that was the core, articulate that as an organizing principle. And that has meant that every single thing that we do, we think about how civic engagement, how our uh, K through 12 focus, how our K through 20 commitments uh, really do relate back to civic engagement. That keeps us honest. Uh, it also means that we're constantly reevaluating um, how we can use the resources that we have, slim though they may be, uh, as a public institution, uh, to actually accomplish what we want to do. <clears throat> I want to mention one other thing, 
It also has entailed collaborating with other universities in the area. So for example, we work with Camden Community College. We also work with uh, Rowan and others in our joint research opportunities. It's focused uh, on uh, the notion that with collaboration, we really can have a greater impact in Camden and the uh, adjoining areas. President Perman. Uh, I would uh, just respond to your question, uh, which is a terrific one, by saying that we've recognized the need to, if you will, take the gown to the town. And uh, we have established a community engagement center uh, in West Baltimore in which all of our schools participate, students, faculty, staff, uh, doing everything from helping people who are on 15 different medications and need some uh, guidance with that to uh, Zumba for seniors, uh, our Just Advice uh, Law School uh, activity. But most importantly, it's doing something for us. It's great that our various schools come out and serve the community in the Community Engagement Center uh, in Workforce Wednesdays, we call it, in terms of helping people getting a job. But what it does for our students is give them a platform, an opportunity to work with each other across disciplines. So that's something that the community gives back to us, enables us to do, because those professionals need to know how to work as a team. Right. Yes. <coughs> Would you please identify yourself, please? Uh, Brian Murphy from uh, California. Um, I just want an observation about the four panelists and then a question. Uh, it has to do with the question of scale. Eduardo, your college enrolls 160,000 students compared to the enrollment of the other three institutions. So the question is the degree to which each of the other institutions uh, aim at, this, at, at the question of inclusion through cooperation and collaboration with the community colleges that enroll the vast majority of first generation non-white students. Um, so that the question of inclusion could include extraordinarily articulated agreements between institutions, each of the three other institutions are themselves radically different from each other, and the community colleges which are in the main the feeders for most universities. The reason I raise that is because, uh, and I'm saying this with deep affection as Ira knows, for the work of the Netter Center and the work of Penn, the degree to which we continue to talk about the different segments of higher education as if they were wholly owned subsidiaries of each other and not related in any kind of way makes it exceptionally difficult to talk realistically about achieving these goals. Um, and yet living right in front of me are four leaders of institutions that are radically different and if they collaborated more could perhaps achieve more. So my question simply is the degree to which each of the other institutions draw, if you will, uh, your first generation students from your community college colleagues. Thank you. Chancellor Head? Yeah, we do. Uh, we, um, as I mentioned, we have uh, an articulated agreement that is a special articulated agreement with Camden County College. Uh, we are on that campus working with students, but they also have an easy pathway into Rutgers uh, Camden uh, if they wish to continue um, beyond being on the campus. Uh, we think that that's critically important. We know that access is defined in many different ways. And so that was one way that we knew that we could, could um, uh, work responsibly, as you're talking about, uh, to develop our community's uh, strengths. We'll take one more response. Well, two more responses then. <laughs> Let's go with we uh, Jay. Well, I was going to say that uh, President Padron's fine institution is, a, is probably a little far for us. But much closer to us is Baltimore City Community College. And not only do we have a relationship, but a program of Baltimore City Community Colleges sits within our biopark. And students from Baltimore Community, City Community College uh, there uh, are educated and trained to be medical technologists both in service labs and in research labs. And I mentioned it sits in the biopark. Because then these students from the city college have the opportunity to work 
within the companies, the biotech companies that are in the biopark and often get jobs there. Yes. Brian, thank you for the uh, question. I think you raise um, perhaps the most important issue here because it's a pipeline that can make the difference in terms of us allowing opportunities for all kinds of students uh, to really succeed at our institutions. And it's both ways. Uh, the, the, the most important pipeline is the K through 12 pipeline, which has been subject to the blame game for too, too long a time. Uh, we blame the high schools for not sending us students that are well prepared. The high schools blame the junior high. The junior high blames the elementary. Mm -hmm. The elementary blames the k uh, k kindergarten, and those people blame the parents. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the meantime, we do very little. And I think until we work very closely with the high schools in our area, all kind of schools, uh, to really uh, uh, save the pipeline, uh, we will not see much progress. One of the things that we do at my institution for years now is faculty to faculty uh, arrangements where the faculty in mathematics, for example, meet with the faculty in the high schools to talk about what is required for the students to know when they finish here in order to be able to succeed in mathematics when they get to college. And the same is true of different uh, disciplines. We also have pre-college advisors on, on every high school to be able to help the students. But we start very early, as you do, because the idea of going to college, which for many of us seems like uh, you know, a natural thing for many families and many students is like a dream that sometimes may not be possible for them. As far as articulating high school to colleges, I have a very good example here, Miami-Dade College and uh, that famous university, Georgetown, <laughs> have had for, what, 30 years now, uh, uh, a partnership where many of our students uh, transfer. Uh, to Georgetown, and we do have those things with many other universities. But it really takes, you are right, it takes all of us working together, not in silos, but understanding that the success of the students depend on all of us uh, pulling our forces together uh, to make those dreams come true. Okay. Yes, I, Jack? If I could just add, um, we, we do have it articulated agreements with the community colleges and both in our region and beyond. Um, and that That's but to your point on scale, uh, th those, those agreements are intended to provide certain kinds of opportunities and to be an example of the responsibilities we have to one another. I mean, the biggest challenge I think we face right now as a nation, we don't have enough young people completing right. two and four year education. If we just use as a marker the economy and the growth of jobs, for, since 1983, our economy has consistently produced more jobs that require post-secondary education than we produce graduates. And this is happening at a time where our, our nation desperately needs ever more graduates of, our, of all of our institutions. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing in exchange? We're watching, as, 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 Eduardo, as, as Eduardo described, the continued decline in public support for our institutions of education, especially the 80% of our education that takes place in our public institutions. As, as, a, as a, a smaller private institution, I know this. We can only thrive if the whole ecosystem of higher education thrives. We need every one of our publics to be able to do everything they can and to achieve the level of the su success that will enable them to make the contribution that only they can make as each of us try to do the unique thing we can in our whole system. But we need the whole system to thrive. I, I couldn't agree with the uh, speakers more because I think this is one of the areas, and Ira and Nancy and I have had multiple conversations about this, uh, and that may be the subject of another panel at some, at some point. I firmly believe that we need stronger presidential leadership in working upstream of these problems. Uh, making sure that kids are reading by third grade, doing math by fourth grade, and they're college ready. Because until we fundamentally deal with those issues in a much more systematic and systemic way, we will continue to struggle with the diversity inclusion efforts that we aspire to achieve. And so I'm going to have to close it at that. Uh, but thank you all for attending, and thank you for your great questions and your participation. Let's give our speakers another round of applause.
Nice to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to see you. Tell everybody I said hello. I want to thank the uh, uh, panelists uh, very much for their incredibly useful and important discussion. I couldn't think of a better way to begin today. I just want to highlight two points very, very quickly, very briefly. What this thing this panel did, I think, was raise two of the most important questions as we move forward in our conversations. And that one is the pathway issue and the pipeline question of how we can start young and build things forward. Robert referred to a committee that I'm on with Nancy, Robert, and Lydia Viakamarov, who's also here. And that committee, which is the committee for NSF that reports to Congress, called the Committee on Equal Opportunities in Science and Engineering, we have turned that committee to say, we have to start young and make the pathway all the way that's through. Right. And the other issue that gets raised for all of our considerations is how we make those linkages with those schools. But the question of our communities, conditions, and situations are deeply connected to inclusion. Mm -hmm. And unless and until we galvanize our resources significantly across our campuses, those problems are going to remain. That's the challenge going forward. I want to thank the panel for raising them. Thank you, Robert, for your great job. Thank you. 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 Thank you.